looked at the battle uh, for the book, the battle for the book. And that's what people try to tear down. They want to tear down the foundation of something. And uh, if you, you know, if uh, I think the same is true uh, in, uh, in football here, but in American football, if you take the legs or the foundation out from someone, they can't run anymore. And that's the same thing with the Bible. When people want to attack the Bible, they want to say, yeah, but it contradicts here, contradicts there. And, and uh, can I go ahead and tell you this right now? There are absolutely positively no literal contradictions in the Word of God. There are apparent contradictions. There are apparent things that change. But the Bible clearly answers the Bible, amen? And uh, I often think it's, it's, it's funny. I read this quote today, I believe. I think it's funny that people say that, well, I can't, the, the King James Bible is too hard to understand. Uh, so they, they, they say they can't understand the reading of the King James Bible, but they believe they need to go to a, la a Greek language to understand what this means uh, in order to, to tell. I mean, that doesn't make any sense to me. Why you're going to go read and study a language that you don't know to tell you about a language that you do know, and, and it makes no sense. I understand uh, that the Word of God uh, has to be believed uh, by faith, but the Word of God is understood by the Holy Spirit of God. That's how a person uh, comes to know what the Word of God is saying and what the Word of God is, is by the spiritual things it is discerned. And when it comes to creation, the first is six days uh, of, the, of, of, of all time, it is no difference. It is a sensational six days, and it is the season of what we're going to look at, the battle for the beginning, the battle for the beginning. So if you will, look in Genesis chapter 1 tonight. I'm going to ask you again to stand as we honor the reading of the Word of God. And I want you to take and put your finger in 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. We'll read, first, uh, we'll read Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. We'll have a, a quick time of prayer, and then you'll have a seat, and we'll look at 1 Timothy here in just a moment. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 simply states this. The Bible says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Amen. The Bible says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Father in heaven, we thank you, dear Lord, for all that you've done. We thank you uh, for creating the heaven and the earth. We thank you for giving us a... A word, Father, that uh, that we can clearly understand, not only that, uh, but it states that there was a beginning. It didn't say one of the beginnings. It didn't say a multitude of beginnings. It says, in the beginning, uh, you created the heaven and the earth. And we know that, and we want to thank you for it this evening. So I pray, dear God, as we continue on in this study tonight, that you would illuminate our minds, our hearts, dear Father. Keep us attentive unto uh, what is to be said, what is to be learned tonight. And please help us, dear God, move along safely and surely and soundly. Trusting in your word, dear God, that we know that you're soon coming back to take us home. Father, let us never be uh, sidetracked, dear God, with the knowledge. Let us uh, maintain the compassion that we need uh, to go out into the hedges and the highways and compel them to come in to your house, Lord, that they may be surely saved and born again of the blood of Christ. We love you now and we thank you for who and what you are. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. And amen. Thanks so much. Please be seated. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 again says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And one of the battles that we find in the battle from the beginning is the argument as to whether or not uh, the, uh, the Word of God is true and as to whether or not there was uh, a multitude of beginnings or whether or not there was the beginning. Uh, if you watch uh, any type of scientific uh, shows today, uh, you'll quickly find out that, that they'll start mentioning uh, that... Um, uh, and I say shows, I don't mean uh, uh, television shows or sci-fi shows, I mean documentaries or whatnot. And uh, they'll be given the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the illustration of how this animal here uh, went from one type of species to another type of species to another type of species, or even within the species, and all of a sudden you have something that's completely different. And I, I heard a man one time, a scientist, uh, giving an illustration of a particular landmass of where they were, and he was referring to uh, the multitude of ice ages is what he mentioned. And he said, well, about 10 billion years ago, uh, and then he went on to explain about what was going on 10 billion years ago. And, and, and I'm going to be uh, just shoot kind of straight with you tonight. Uh, if I was to tell you this evening to picture in your mind what 10 billion is, you could not do that. Amen. I could not do that. Uh, I've seen the comparisons of what the difference between 1 million and 10 million and 100 million is compared to 10 billion. And it is so inherently different that our finite minds can't say that there was 10 billion uh, uh, years that this took place. Uh, but what it is, my friend, it is science trying to replace 
uh, <coughs> what we've been taught in faith by the Word of God and what God had performed in His creation. And they call it science. And then they say, well, science and the Bible, uh, they cannot coexist. And beloved, can I tell you this tonight? They have to coexist because the Bible gives us the creation of all things, which includes, guess what? Science. First Timothy chapter 6 and verse 20. First Timothy chapter 6 and verse 20. This is what the Bible says. It says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain battlings and oppositions of science, watch this, falsely so-called. Verse 21 says, which some professing have erred concerning the faith, grace be with thee, amen. The battle, my friend, is for the beginning. When was the beginning? What was the beginning? Uh, uh, do we have a, a belief of a theistic evolution uh, where they say, yes, there's a grand designer. There is a God that is out there and uh, he created everything, but he created it in order for it to evolve into the magnitude of what we have today. And, 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 and frankly, that is just illogical. That is not logical today for these so-called scientists out there. And it's science, falsely so-called, as Paul so eloquently put it, in his first letter unto the young man, Timothy. The skeptic and atheist Robert Egersall uh, once visited a noted preacher by the name of Dr. Henry Ward Beecher. If you don't know who uh, uh, Henry Ward Beecher was, uh, he's a very famously quoted preacher of yesteryear. Uh, it would behoove you, if you could, to, to read up on Henry Ward Beecher and some of the orientations that he has given uh, from the Word of God and how it applies to our life today. Uh, but he visited uh, Henry Ward Beecher one time who took him into a study to show him some of his theological books. And in Dr. Beecher's study, there was this magnificent globe of the world and all the mountains and valleys that were painted in it. Uh, it, was, it was just a beautiful work of art. And Ingersoll, uh, who was very bright, he was a highly educated man, he looked at the globe and he said, Dr. Beecher, that's one of the most beautiful pieces of work I've ever seen. Who made it for you? Beecher smiled and said, oh, nobody made it. It just happened. <laughs> Dr. Beecher's point was well made because for over the last 100 years, there has been a battle raging in our life and raging in the lives of our children and raging in our, the life of our parents and some of our grandparents. There's been this battle raging in our land over the origin of man and the universe itself. And it is called tonight the battle of the beginning. We are battling for the beginning, and we have all sorts of groups of people that are battling for it, both inside the church and outside the church. That's one thing that we need to understand. Just because they say Christian on it does not distinguish the fact that they're going to agree with what we refer to tonight as the sensational six days of creation. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say this out in the forefront, and then we're going to go over a lot of didactics tonight, and then we'll be finished. But I'm going to say this. Uh, without a shadow of a doubt, God created the heaven and he created the earth. He did so, everything that was created, he did so in six literal days. Not six prophetical days, not in six years, not in six thousand years, none of those things. He created the heaven and the earth in six literal days. And when he said in the evening and the morning were the first day, that was the very first day that we've ever seen. That was day one of all the time that we know. And I don't know how many days we can add it up. We know biblically speaking that, that a year was considered to be 360 days. We use a 365 day calendar today. I understand all of that principle. We can go over that uh, at a later date. But if you're to add up however many days that God has allotted, and there's going to come a time, we know a, a thousand year millennial reign will be in the, uh, will be a literal reign of Jesus Christ uh, in the land grant that God given to Abraham, passed down from Abraham to Isaac, unto Jacob, and unto Israel. Amen. That will, that's where the the millennial reign will occur uh, for 1,000 years here on the earth. The curse will be lifted because the earth will be purified by the second coming of Christ, and uh, known in Peter 3.10. So we'll have that that will occur in there. That's 1,000 years. Seven years, we know, uh, is going to occur with the tribulation period, also known as Daniel's 70th week or time of Jacob's trouble. We know that. That's 1,007 years. And then you got roughly 2,000 years of the church age and 4,000 years prior to that. So we understand all of those things. But here's what I'm saying. 
When God said, and time shall be no more, the end of the great white throne judgment, eternity picks back up again, and time shall be no more. The very first day of time being no more, the very first day of time is the day we just spoke of, the evening and the morning was the first day. God created the heaven and the earth in six literal days. We want to understand that. Tonight we're going to look at some of the things that our opposition believes, uh, how it came about, and what they call as the theory of evolution. But the entire creation-evolution debate can be summed up in this question. Are the first chapters of Genesis, listen carefully, and this is what you have to ask yourself in your heart. Are the first chapters of Genesis literally true or are they not? Were we created supernaturally by a sovereign act of God or did we evolve by chance from a cosmic accident? Well, think about what Beecher's remark was to Ingersoll when he said, that is a beautiful piece of art. Who made that for you? And he simply said, no one did. It just happened. If you look around here, I read the history of, of our church building here. <laughs> And it amazes me what they built this beautiful work of art for, you know, back in 1849 and then in 1851 and 1856. It's amazing how inexpensive it was then. Couldn't even imagine trying to do it today. But to believe that our world today just happened by accident is to believe that the artwork in this building tonight just happened. That maybe the, maybe the workers just showed up one day and they just dropped off the trees and the wood and the plaster and the paint and left and they came back the next day and there it was. Or better yet, they dropped it off and a hundred years later it just formed. That, that doesn't make sense, does it? You know, another thing that doesn't make sense, if you just leave something out, does it get better? Does it get worse? It gets worse, doesn't it? It's called deterioration. But for some reason, a so-called scientific community, which is science falsely so-called, believes that if something's around long enough, it improves. Well, I don't know about you. I'm 43 years old, and I'm not doing better than I was when I was 23, as far as my health goes. Amen? Amen. I have joints that hurt now, eyes that don't see near as well as they used to. I got a head that doesn't have near as much hair as it had when I was 23, amen. Yes, some of that is my choice, but other is not, amen. I realize that. So I don't see where the logic comes in. So we have to ask our question tonight. We have to ask our heart to see. Are the first chapters of Genesis literal or are they not? Were we created by supernatural? Or will we be created supernaturally by a sovereign God? Or we just evolve by chance? Let's look at evolution tonight, if you will, just real quick. I want you to look at number one at the definition of the theory of evolution. And guys, that is exactly what it is. It is not a fact. It is not a proven science. It's not proven anything other than being wrong. But it is the definition of the theory of evolution. And evolution is defined uh, as an unrolling or unfolding. It simply means a process of change. Now, we don't like to use the word uh, evolve. Uh, but to say the word evolved is to say is for the same word uh, you could say developed, okay? Now I know us as Bible believers, we, we don't like to use evolution in anything, amen. We don't even want to give credence to the word, and, and I can understand that, but it is just nomenclature. That is all evolution means. It means a process of change. And when we look at our life, we want our church to evolve better and better and better, do we not? And it can. We want to develop into better Christians, we want to have a better church, we want to have a bigger people. We want to have more ministries. We want to have greater outreach. We want that to happen and that can happen. And by definition, that is really all evolution means is a process of change. Amen. And that's what it is. But when it comes to the matter of science and the theory of evolution, there are basically two types of evolution. Okay. Basically two types of evolution. Number one, there is what's known as microevolution, which is limited change that takes place, takes place 
within a species because of genetic mutations or makeup. Genetic mutations or makeup. Now, microevolution, we can understand. If we turn back to Genesis in chapter 1, Genesis in chapter 1, and I want you to look at four verses in this first chapter. Notice the phrase here that you're going to see in Genesis 1, verse 11, you see, after his kind. Notice in verse 11, the Bible says, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass and herb, uh, yielding seed, and the, fir and the fruit tree yielding fruit after, uh, after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. I love the last part, and it was so. If you look in verse 12, we find the same thing. And, and the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding a seed after his kind. Look in verse 21. Verse 21. And God created great whales and every living creature uh, that moveth, uh, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind. And every winged fowl after his kind. God saw that it was good. Look down in verse 24. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so. Uh, so we find the species in creation allows for those uh, to be a variant, a variation of change within one kind of species. But microevolution, if you will, never, never, never <clears throat> do we find uh, one kind of species becoming another kind of species. And that's what the theory of evolution is based upon. One going from a particular species to another species, okay? And uh, here's, an here's a good example. I think I got a graph up here, uh, if we will. Uh, the, the various kinds of dogs. Uh, go, go forward one day, if you will. There we go, quickly. Uh, the dog kind, all right? Here's the... Here's the uh, uh, here's a good example. You got the wolf, okay? And then from the wolf, we have a coyote, we have a dingo, we got a collie, and then of course down here, um, we got a poodle. And uh, there's just something wrong with the poodle. I don't like the poodle way, man. Uh, you, you say, well, what is that? That's a mutation, is what that is, okay? I'm not being, I'm not saying that. I mean, I think, a, I do think a poodle's a mutant, but nevertheless, um, I think they're weird. I, I think they're strange. Um, I, I, you know, somebody said, do you believe in aliens? I said, no, I believe in poodles, but nevertheless. So what, what I'm saying is, you see that this is all one kind. They're all dogs, right? They, they, like I mentioned here, I mentioned to the youth last week, week before, if something was walked through the door and had feathers, an orange beak, and some and some feet that was uh, positioned out like that, and it went quack, 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 what would it be? Well, it'd be a duck, and we know that, and it would reproduce after its kind. It's the same principle we find here, as we'd call microevolution, is that it's just one, it's, it's still a dog, and they're producing after their kind. And the Lord will allow for a uh, for variation within one species, but he will never, 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 never allow from one species to be developed into another one, of which they call now macro evolution, macro evolution, which is the unlimited change that leads to the existence of a new species from a previously existing one. I, I find it comical if, if you do watch a scientific documentary and they say, we just discovered a new species. You know what? You know, you know one reason I'm never... Uh, like if I get a news report that comes across the phone or on the email or whatever, I never get, I never get, I never get moved uh, toward the fact that hey, they found a new species. You know, well, you know why that doesn't move me? Because Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. Absolutely. You know, just because we haven't seen it, Amen, doesn't mean it's new. Uh, one of my my boys, uh, Daniel, uh, he'll say, Dad, I said, Son, where'd you get that? Uh, I don't know, knife or whatever. And uh, he goes, Well, I found it. I said, Was it lost? And you know what I'm saying to him. It's not new. It wasn't lost. You found it, probably on your brother's side of the bedroom. And all of a sudden, there it is. You found it, amen. And it's his. And uh, but, but it wasn't lost. It wasn't like it, something that new popped up, but he found it, right? And so, uh, you know, we were going to church one morning. We was in Tennessee. And uh, <coughs> I had heard of the news the day before, the evening before. And I uh, can't remember exactly what I was studying, but I saw this this news report of this one particular type of woodpecker that was a big bird, and it was, I mean, it was huge, and, uh, and it was distinctive, and these scientists are going over how they, uh, man, you know, these things have been extinct, and, and we just newly discovered them, they haven't been one seen in, you know, 100 years, they were just raving and raving and raving about this bird, right? And we're driving on 431, we're going to church that morning, guess what flew in front of my windshield? That bird, 
And you say, oh, you're crazy, preacher. No, I'm telling you right now, it was the same picture. They had on the news the night before, and there he was. It's not new. God does those things, I think, in a great way just to mock people out, just to show, look, it is science falsely so-called. Macroevolution believes in the unlimited change that leads to the existence of a new species from a previously existing one. And this is the theory that was postulated by Charles Darwin in his book, The Origin of the Species. Over 150 plus years ago, he wrote this book. And in essence, Darwin said that living matter evolved from dead matter through a random process plus time. <coughs> that all plants, animals, and people evolved from a common ancestor through a random process of natural selection that ensures, listen to this, the survival of the fittest. I have a, an enormous problem with that right there. Because if, if, if it took all of these millions of years for us to evolve, and the, it's based upon the ideology of the survival of the fittest, then explain to me now why we still have certain uh, creatures that are not the fittest today. He could not explain that. Uh, he tried to establish this belief system here. He tried to take it and place it into the lives of human beings. And he even began to postulate, as I mentioned before, that in the human species, there is a survival of the fittest. And he did so by, by because, number one, he was a racist, if you will and begin to use that theory uh, to, distinct, to, to distinctively say that there were inferior races. Uh, the Bible tells me that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It says nothing about our race. It says nothing about our ethnicity. It says nothing about uh, our, our, our language, whatever it is. Uh, we are, God's not a respecter of a person. It doesn't matter who we are. <clears throat> amen <coughs> and amen. Carl Sagan is another scientist so-called it says that all living things arise by blind physical and chemical forces over eons from slime. He goes on to say, and human beings and all other species have slowly evolved by natural, natural processes from a succession of more ancient beings with no divine intervention needed along the way. So evolution uh, is the theory that all forms of life as we know it came from one common ancestor. That, that uh, they want us to believe that that out of non-life came life. That out of some cosmic explosion or the Big Bang uh, theory, as they call it, uh, came the present universe, came into existence, and all life forms evolved from some little teeny lower life form. In essence, the evolutionist wants us to believe that nothing times nobody equals everything. Now think about that for just a second. They want us to believe that nothing times nobody equals everything. Now guys, listen. I'm a Bible believer, and if the Bible told me that the, that the sky turns purple at midnight every 31st day of the year, I'll believe it. Amen? But even if I was not a Bible believer tonight, this right here is a theory that does not, lack of better terms, hold water, and it doesn't even make practical sense. So that was the definition of evolution. Let's look secondly tonight at the deficiency of the theory of evolution. Two questions on this. The deficiency of the theory of evolution. Two questions that come to mind is we need to consider the theory of evolution. Number one, could evolution happen? Could it happen? Number two, we need to, we need to ask ourselves, did evolution happen? And the answer to both of those are unequivocally no. All right. Could it happen? Absolutely, positively not. Did it happen? Of course not. We know that. And here are two reasons why. Number one, there is a, <coughs> a flaw in what they call the fossil record. A fossil or the remains of, of animal and plant life embedded into the earth's crust. And this is what Thomas Huxley said. Thomas Huxley said that the primary and direct evidence in favor of evolution can be furnished only by paleontology. If evolution has taken place, it, its marks will be left. If it has not taken place, there will be its reputation. Evolutionists claim that their theory will either be proved or disproved in the fossil record. 
Now, what's funny about that is that every living being descended, uh, if every living being descended from a common ancestor and people and animals were not separately created, uh, then you would have to expect somewhere along the line to find ancient fossils, thousands of, of intermediate types of forms of creatures, or what they call today the missing link. Wouldn't you expect to find that? If the answer lies in the fossil record, we should find half birds, half fish. Uh, we should find a half dog and a half cat, a half ape and a half man. We should find that. But it's not there. Because it is a flaw in the fossil record. Uh, as far as we go, as we know right now, the fossil record is anti-Darwinian. The fossil record proves the evolutionists have to look somewhere else for their evidences in their theory of evolution. Charles Darwin said this, innumerable transitional forms must have existed, but why do we not find them embedded in countless numbers of the crust of the earth? He answered his own question, because it did not happen. Because it did not happen. I, I think it's funny how they say, how many millions of years it takes to fossilize a particular item or whatever. And just about 10, 10 12 years ago in the Snake River, the Grand Canyon uh, in, in Southwest America, someone dredged up a pair of fossilized, petrified, preserved cowboy boots. Millions of years it takes, huh? Now, last time I checked, cowboy boots were not invented until the mid-1800s, so nevertheless. Evolutionist T.H. Morgan, he wrote in his book, Evolution and Adaptation, he said, within the period of human history, we do not know of a single instance of the transformation of one species into another. It may be claimed that the theory of descent is lacking. In reference to the absence of evolutionary evidence in a fossil record, one said this, evolution always seems to happen, watch this, somewhere else. Well, we know it happened, they'll say, scientists falsely so-called. We know that it happened, it had to happen, it had to occur, but it had to happen somewhere else that we can't prove. <clears throat> Lewis T. Moore said that uh, the more one studies paleontology, which is the fossil record, the more certain one becomes that evolution is based, listen and watch, on faith alone. Professor Enoch, a leading zoologist, stated the facts of paleontology, which is the fossil record, seem to support creation and the flood rather than evolution. We were standing atop a, a, um, a mountain. We weren't actually on top of Pilot Mountain in, uh, in North Carolina, uh, but we were on top of an area there close by. It was at the park, but not on the actual mountain. And we crawled way up on this area there and got way up on the land. And me and a couple guys from the church there in North Carolina, and we went hiking that day. And we sat down and we just began to look around and just began to enjoy the view. Massive. I mean, we're high, way high up in the air. And we're looking through some of the rocks there and looking at the rocks. And, and guess what's embedded inside the stone? The seashells. I always thought that was funny. Because, you know, if we evolved, and even if Pangaea was something that the scientists claim how it occurred, well, then that shouldn't have been there. But we know of a colossal flood where every landmass in this planet was covered by water at one time. Amen and amen. So we know that the fossil record, the flaw in the fossil record is evidence that that did not occur, that, that it supports creation in the flood rather than evolution. But number two, guys, there is the dilemma of life as we know it tonight. The dilemma of life as we know it. For evolution to be true, Life had to spontaneously spring from a non-living matter. That means that from non-life, one must have life. <coughs> and the last time I checked, I don't believe that can happen. And that is, the, that is the detriment for the evolutionist, is that there is no scientific proof that life did or ever could have spontaneously generated from a non-living matter. Interestingly enough, uh, the renowned scientist uh, Louis Pasteur, along with others, has disproven the theory that life could spontaneously generate or evolve from a non-living matter. They did so over 160 years ago. You see, Darwin's problem is that he tried to explain the survival of the fittest, but he cannot explain 
the arrival of the fish. He's trying to explain the survival of something before he explains the arrival thereof. Beloved, every living thing on this planet tonight came from another living thing. It's that simple. We know by common uh, study today, we know of, of DNA. We, we understand that, which is a super molecule within the, uh, the chromosomes. It presents, uh, it, it presents itself in the nucleus of our cells and it stores coded hereditary information. DNA is made up of two long chains of chemical building blocks, if you will, that are paired together and are unique uh, to each individual. That's why we've seen more uh, prisoners set free as of late, as in these latter years, who've been in prison for 7, 10, 15, some 20 plus years, and they've been set free because of the DNA evidence today is not linking them to the case. As a matter of fact, the, uh, the very evidence that they use saying that this was their uh, their skin cells or this was their, their hair fiber has been taken and, and studied and determined that it's not even theirs. So DNA is an important and it's unique to each individual. These are cells containing such a complex code and such uh, the in, uh, some intricate chemistry that it could not have come from something just by chance. If you were to change one micron in your DNA today, that was possible, you would be a completely different creature than you are right now. Just one. Just one. Sir Fred Hoyle, uh, one of Great Britain's foremost scientists, said there is about as much chance of life being spontaneously produced as there is a tornado blowing through a junkyard and building a Boeing 747. And we know that to be true. The faith of an evolutionist gets in the way of the facts of science. And so DNA, what should DNA be? Do not accept evolution is what we should say that DNA Proves. Amen. So let's look at the, the devolution of the theory of evolution, the devolution of the theory of evidence. So the next question that comes to mind in our hearts today is that if the theory of evolution did not happen and could not happen, of which we've already answered, why do so many scientists, professors, educators, teachers, why are they so, so, so fanatically devoted? Why are they so de uh, uh, fanatically devoted and why do they uh, so vigorously defended. Why are they so devoted to it? So when we look at the devotion uh, to the theory of evolution tonight, we've got to ask ourselves, why are they so devoted to the fact that, that evolution is real? Why, is it, why do they believe that it's true? And I'll give you a couple reasons here. British evolutionist Sir Arthur Keith say, stated that evolution is unproved and improvable. He said, we believe it, uh, we believe it, we believe it because the only alternative is special creation. Thomas Huxley, again, uh, to quote him, he said, it is clear that the doctrine of evolution is directly agnostic to, uh, or antagonistic to uh, that of creation. Evolution is consistently accepted, makes it impossible to believe the Bible. He says, if it is consistently accepted, it's impossible to believe the Bible. Dr. George Worrell, professor emeritus of biology at Harvard University and Nobel Peace Prize winner in biology uh, in 1971, this is what he said. He said, there are only two possibilities out to how, as to how life arose. One is spontaneous generation arising to evolution. The other is a supernatural creative act of God. He said, there is no third possibility. Spontaneous generation to believe that life comes from non-living matter was scientifically disproved 120 years ago by Louis Pasteur and others. That just leaves us with only one other possibility that life arose as a creative act of God. But I will not accept that philosophy, he says, because I do not want to believe in God. Therefore, I choose to believe in that which I know is scientifically impossible. Spontaneous generation leading to evolution. Did you note what Dr. Ward said? Note his words. He said, I will not accept it. And I choose to believe because he does not want to accept to God. He chooses to believe evidences are willfully biased against God. And that are supernatural. He says, I choose not to believe that. He goes, I will not accept it. But it proves to you and I tonight <coughs> that evolution is not a science, but it is a faith-based religion that has Darwin as its prophet 
and the origin of species as its Bible. So that is the devotion of evolution. So fourthly tonight, and I believe, thank you, hold there, son. This is a, a comic strip that I spent quite a bit of time trying to find. I remember reading it about 15 years ago. There's a man by the name of Johnny Marr. He has passed on and went home to be with the Lord. He was a born-again believer in Christ. Uh, he had a comic strip called uh, BC. And, uh, and he was the, the most censored comic artist that we could ever find. And uh, but he was in the newspapers, he was in the comics. And, and I remember this particular comic strip because I thought it was so beautiful. And, and I, I just picked it up in the middle. And it says, how do, how do you know that he exists? And speaking of God, she was praying. And she said, I just know. It's called faith. It must take incredible faith to believe in a God you can't see. She says, not really. Well, see, before this, this guy right here gets bowing down. He walked by and mocked her out for praying. She walks up to him and he's praying to a half monkey, a wing, half monkey, half fish, whatever that thing is. And she says, that takes incredible faith. And it does. To believe that something living came from something that was not living spontaneously without a supernatural sovereign act of God. That, my friend, takes incredible faith. And friend, that is all tonight. The devotion of evolution is 100% based on faith. Fourthly and finally tonight, the danger of believing uh, the theory of evolution. In his book, Darwin's Dangerous Idea, Evolution and the Meaning of Life uh, uh, is, is written by uh, Dennett, a man by the name of Dennett. Uh, in 1995, he writes about the fantasy of what he calls universal acid. He said, as a liquid that is so corro uh, corrosive. Now, speaking of evolution, this is what he said. is that it is a liquid that is so corrosive that it would eat through anything that it came into contact with, even a potential container. So powerful of a substance would transform everything it was applied to, leaving something very different in its wake. This is where Dennett draws parallels from the universal acid to the ideas of Darwin or from Darwinian ideas. He says it eats through just about every traditional concept and it leaves in its wake a revolutionized worldview with most of old landmarks still recognizable but transformed in fundamental ways. My friend, the dangers of believing evolution tonight go well beyond a confused idea of how the world began. You see, believing uh, in evolution tonight goes well beyond the thoughts of, well, can't we just accept that we came here to this earth and, um, you know, maybe there was a divine creator out there. Maybe there was a supernatural event. Maybe there was something that, that was a big bang. But, and, and maybe God had something to do with it. But, but can't we just accept the idea that maybe we just came from monkeys and apes? And I mean, no, no, no. We can't accept that. Because here's the dangers of that. The dangers of teaching a child evolution. When you teach children that they came from nothing. And when they die, they go to nothing. Do you know what they equate in their mind? They say, I am nothing. You say, well, preacher, you're, I think you're just embellishing a little bit. That can't be true. You tell me why it's not true. You tell me tonight why that would not be true. And then I'll go ahead and tell you tonight exactly why it is true. Because the reality this evening is we know as we begin to look at life as we know it tonight, that the value of life is not where it once was. You see, in the Genesis series, we begin to look at where we are today. Life used to be valued. But you teach a generation of children that, well, you just kind of happened. And you're just an accident. You're really not wanted. And then they say, well, when I die, well, you, you just cease to exist. You're going to go nowhere. Then guess what they say in their mind? They say, well, I am nothing. I'm just here. Much of what I mentioned this morning, that we've got a group of people in this world today, a, a large group of people in this world today, they want to find the purpose of their existence, why they're here on this planet. 
Frankly, they just want to be able to see. They just want their eyes. They want to see what you see. And they're crying out to be seen because they want to see why they're here. So, beloved, we, we, we as a society, I'm not saying we, I know I haven't taught evolution, never will, uh, by God's grace. But we as a society have taught children that, you know, you just happened and when you die, you just cease to exist. So, you know, live it up now while you can. You know, eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow you may die. We've taught them that. And in doing so, the, the, the only conclusion that a child can come to this evening, the only one, is that if I came from nothing and I'm going to nothing, then I must be nothing. That tonight, my friend, is the dangers of believing the theory of evolution. Let's bow our heads and close in prayer. Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for the study tonight. We thank you, dear God, for opening up our eyes. We thank you for the two weeks of introductions, if you will, Lord, as we begin to look at the six sensational days that you created, all things that are and all things that ever have been. And I pray that you continue to build this foundation in our hearts and our minds as we begin to dissect the Scripture and evaluate that which you've given us, the, uh, the evidences, if you will, of creation, dear God, that is impossible to refute and still claim uh, the reality of what you've done in this world. So, Father, I pray that you would continue to open up our minds of understanding, uh, illuminate the Word of God into our hearts today, bring us closer to you as we continue to walk in this world, and bless us, Father, for the concluding of this service tonight, and we may bring honor and glory to thy wonderful name. In Christ's name we ask these things. Amen and amen. Do hope and pray that God was good to you tonight. Uh, I do realize there was only a handful.